humbly and gratefully, I stand before you, grateful for patriots such as you, humbled by the magnitude of the task before us. I speak to you as a fellow citizen of the United States of America, deeply concerned about the welfare of our beloved country. I am not here to tickle your ears, to entertain you. I will talk to you frankly and honestly. The message I bring is not a happy one, but it is the truth. And time is always on the side of truth. As the German philosopher Goethe said, truth must be repeated again and again because error is constantly being preached round about. I realize that the bearer of bad news is always unpopular. As a people, we love sweetness and light, especially sweetness. Ralph Waldo Emerson said that every mind must make a choice between truth and hoes. Those who will learn nothing from history are condemned to repeat it. This we are doing in the Americas today. George Washington stated, truth will ultimately prevail where there are pains taken to bring it to light. To bring the truth to light is our challenge this day and every day. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Returning recently from two years abroad has caused me to reflect seriously on recent trends and present conditions in our beloved country. I am shocked and saddened at what I find. I am sorry to say that all is not well in so-called prosperous, wealthy, and powerful America. We have moved a long way and are now moving further and more rapidly down the soul-destroying road of socialism. The evidence is clear, shockingly clear, for all to see. With our national prestige at or near an embarrassing all-time low, we continue to weaken our domestic economy by unsound fiscal, economic, and foreign aid policies which corrupt our national currency. Ever-increasing centralization of power in the federal government in Washington, D.C. is reducing our local and state governments to virtual federal field offices while weakening individual initiative, enterprise, and character. With the crass unconstitutional usurpation of power by the executive branch of the federal government, anti-spiritual decisions of the Supreme Court, all apparently approved by a weakly submissive rubber stamp Congress, the days ahead are ominously frightening. Surely, certainly, it behooves patriotic citizens such as you to meet together to seriously consider present conditions in our beloved nation. It is imperative that American citizens become alerted and informed regarding the threat to our welfare, happiness, and freedom. No American is worthy of citizenship in this great land who refuses to take an active interest in these important matters. All we hold dear as a great Christian nation is at stake. In leaving for Europe two years ago, I could not help but feel a very deep sense of anxiety for this great land of America which had just passed through a terrible crisis. To have the President of the United States suddenly torn from his high office by the violent hand of an assassin was an insidious and dastardly act which struck at the very foundation of our republic. All of us felt the impact of it. All of us caught the ominous spirit of tragedy and sorrow which accompanied it. Each of us sensed in a very personal way the heartbreak which had come to the Kennedy family. But after the services and burial were over, we also realized something else. There was the cold, stark reality that the assassin's murder of President Kennedy was just one more monstrous treachery 
in the long list of crimes against humanity which have been inspired down through the years by the godless philosophy of communism. It was communism that sowed the seeds of treason in the mind of President Kennedy's assassin. This is something which must not be forgotten. And now, two years and one month later, I am appalled at the shortness of our memories when the events surrounding President Kennedy's assassination were remembered last December, practically no mention was made of Oswald's communist affiliations, nor the present communist threat to our society. Have we so soon forgotten that communism sowed the seeds of hate that destroyed our president, and that communism continually seeks to subvert and destroy our complete way of life? The assassination of President Kennedy, the daily slaughter of our boys in Vietnam, the communist control of the Berkeley riots, and communist-inspired demonstrations from coast to coast should serve as a shock therapy to that segment of our population who like to call themselves liberals. America is big enough to make room for many different kinds of thinking. But many liberals have claimed to see virtues in socialism and communism, which I, for one, have not been able to find. To promote their ideas, American liberals have become a highly organized, hardcore establishment in the United States. And they have been excusing their appeasement and coddling of communism on the ground that they were being tolerant, broad-minded, and working for peace. But the assassination of President Kennedy should have jolted them into a realization that they have been pampering, protecting, and promoting the very nest of serpents which produced Lee Harvey Oswald, the diabolical spirit of murder and violence which struck down the president is that same spirit of communist violence which has been allowed to spread its terror into the heart of every continent upon the face of the earth. Perhaps those who have been apologists for this conquering Marxist socialist communist movement might now agree to reconsider the fatal decision they have been following. Two additional things happened in connection with this tragedy which are worthy of comment. First was the speed with which the communist leaders spread the word that the slaying of the president must have been the work of American conservatives. Moscow has conducted a five-year campaign to make American conservatives look like hysterical fanatics. It was called them, it has called them rightists, extremists, and even fascists. Within an hour after the assassination and before Oswald was captured, Moscow was assuring the world that this crime was the product of the rightist movement in the United States. The second thing which happened was the amazing rapidity with which American liberals took up the Moscow line. They too were quick to fix the blame, even though there hadn't been the slightest hint as to who had committed the crime. I wonder what would have happened if Oswald had not been captured and identified as an active communist who was in direct contact with party headquarters in New York City. Undoubtedly, the liberal element would be blaming this tragedy on conservative Americans to this day. And even after Oswald was captured and identified as a Moscow-associated communist, there were those who insisted that any who had opposed the president during his term of high office was guilty of the same spirit of hate as that which led to the president's death. This line of thinking was expressed by a number of prominent persons through the press, radio, and TV. To me, it was incomprehensible. To equate Oswald's hate and homicidal bitterness with patriotic Americans who happened to oppose some of the policies of the president's administration was the height of distorted and fallacious thinking. The American people can respect their president, pray for their president, 
even have a strong affection for him, and still have an honest difference of opinion as to the merits of some of his programs. Another recent development has been the call for national unity. I believe there needs to be unity in our land, but it must not be a blind, senseless, irresponsible unity. It should not be a unity just for the sake of unity. It needs to be a unity built on sound principles. We Americans have strayed far from sound principles, morally, constitutionally, and historically. It has been getting us into a quagmire of trouble all over the world, and especially here at home. Americans at the grassroots level have sensed that their way of life is being threatened. During the last several years, there has been a rising tide of resistance to the prevailing political trend. Comp compromises with communism abroad and flirtations with socialism at home have stirred up opposition in both political parties. If this has left sound constitutional principles on which we can unite. There would be no virtue in calling for unity to support certain legislation if the majority of Americans were opposed to it. And the fact that both Democrats and Republicans in Congress have at times resisted certain legislation shows that the executive branch of the government may get out of step with the people. I believe the American people know what they want. It would appear that the people want their civil rights safeguarded but not a destruction of states' rights. The farmers want opportunity for reasonable income security, but not agricultural dictatorship security. Parents want better school for their children, but not a federal subsidy leading to control of the teachings and textbooks as well as the ideologies of the children. People want sound pay-as-you-go spending, with a balanced budget, not reckless spending and tax cuts with an unbalanced budget. If there is a need for urban renewal, people want it under local direction, not under the red tape of Washington bureaus armed with confiscatory powers over property. People want the development of power dams, but not the strangulation of privately owned power companies, which have proven far more efficient and economical and utilities run by the government. In other words, there are some legitimate functions and services which the federal government can and should provide. But those who want the federal power to exceed the authority delegated to it by the Constitution will be resisted both by Democrats and Republicans. This is what is happening in some limited areas today. May the trend increase. <laughs> and anyone who tries to equate this love of constitutional principles as meaning hatred of our national leaders is using Goebbels-style deception. History has already demonstrated that conservative opposition to national leaders was not hate, but an attempt to do them a favor. Let me give you some examples. Was it hate when General Albert C. Wedemeyer pleaded with General Marshall and President Truman to reverse their policy before they lost China? Was it hate when Whitaker Chambers tried to warn President Roosevelt in 1939 that Alger Hiss had been giving the Soviet Union more espionage data than any other member of the Washington spy network? Was it hate when J. Edgar Hoover tried to warn President Truman that Harry Dexter White was a member of the Soviet spy apparatus and was doing great danger to the nation as Assistant Secretary of the Treasury? Was it hate when I went to the Secretary of State under President Eisenhower and pleaded with him not to support the communist Fidel Castro? Was it hate when I urged the President of the United States to go to the aid of the brave freedom fighters in Hungary? Was it hate when the Democratic Senator from Connecticut, Thomas Dodd, pleaded for two years 
Will the president not to support the United Nations bloodbath against the free people of Katanga? Is it hate when distinguished military leaders advise that an all-out effort could end the Vietnam struggle almost overnight? This list of acts by well-meaning citizens who want and wanted to prevent their president from making serious mistakes could be extended at length. But they would all illustrate the same point. History will show that many terrible mistakes occurred because the advice of these well-informed and well-meaning citizens was not heeded. Therefore, I repeat, this kind of resistance to a national leader is rooted in love and respect, not hate. Regardless of which political party is in power, you do not want to see your president make a serious blunder. You don't want him to lose China. You don't want him to allow the enemy agents to make fools of us. You don't want him to lose Cuba. You don't want him to suffer the, hum the humiliation of a Bay of Pigs disaster or allow a Soviet Gibraltar to be built 90 miles from our shores. Every one of these events, which have been so disastrous and which have destroyed freedom for hundreds of millions of our allies, could have been prevented and the voices of those who tried to warn Washington of what was coming cannot be attributed to hate. It has been out of a love for our country and respect for our leaders that the voice of warning has been raised. What causes one to wonder is why these warnings were not carefully considered and acted upon. Why is it that men in high places in government, regardless of party, have been deceived? I am convinced that a major part of the cause can be justly laid at the door of the socialist-communist conspiracy, which is led by masters of deceit who deceive the very elect. J. Edgar Hoover put it well when he said, quote, I would have no fears if more Americans possessed the zeal, the fervor, the persistence, and the industry to learn about this menace of red fascism. I do fear for the liberal and progressive who have been hoodwinked and duped into joining with the communists." End quote. Therefore, let those who call for unity and the elimination of hate be sure they are not merely trying to silence the friends of freedom. These are who respect their leaders and resist them only when it is felt they are headed for a catastrophe. What patriotic American would wish to stand silent if he saw the president verging on a blunder because of bad av advice or a mistaken judgment of the facts? I believe one of the most serious mistakes the president could make would be to weaken the Constitution. From the time I was a small boy, I was taught that the American Constitution is an inspired document. I was also taught that the day will come when the Constitution will be endangered and hang as it were by a single thread. I was taught that we should study the Constitution, preserve its principles, and defend it against any who would destroy it. To the best of my ability, I have always tried to do this. I expect to continue my efforts to help protect and safeguard our inspired Constitution. Some two years ago, however, a critic from Washington, D.C. claimed that a person who serves in a church capacity should not comment on such matters. He charged that the separation of church and state requires that church officials restrict their attention to the affairs of the church. I, of course, also believe that the institutions of church and state should be separated. But I also do not agree that spiritual leaders cannot comment on basic issues which involve the very foundation of American liberty. In fact, if this were true, we would have to throw away a substantial part of the Bible. Speaking out against immoral, 
or unjust actions of political leaders has been the burden of prophets and disciples of God from time immemorial. It was for this very reason that many of them were persecuted. Some of them were stoned, some of them were burned, many were imprisoned. Nevertheless, it was their God-given task as watchmen on the towers to speak up. It is certainly no different today. To Moses, God said, Proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. Why? For God knows full well that the gospel, his plan of, for the blessing of his children, can prosper only in an atmosphere of freedom. To modern men, God has said, the Constitution should be maintained for the rights and protection of all flesh. Is the Constitution being maintained, or is it in jeopardy? Senator J. William Fulbright of Arkansas says the American Constitution is nothing more than a product of the 18th century agrarian society. It is now obsolete, he claims. Senator Joseph S. Clark of Pennsylvania says the separation of powers with its checks and balances must be curtailed because they keep the president from making quick and decisive decisions. Gus Hall, head of the Communist Party USA, agrees with these two senators. Yes, Gus Hall agrees with these two senators and demands that there should be a new federal charter eliminating states' rights. America's national sovereignty should be abandoned, according to Walt Rostow, chairman of the Senate of the State Department Policy Planning Board. He has boldly demanded, quote, an end of nationhood as it has been historically defined. Now these are some of the same men who see great virtue in a collectivized, socialized society. They want vast powers concentrated in Washington. Samuel Adams of the Founding Fathers said this was the very thing constitutional government was designed to prevent. Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr. is another powerful influence in Washington and a former presidential advisor. He not only advocates socialism for the United States, but believes that we could eventually form a permanent alliance with communism. He says this would be achieved by having America move to the left while the communists moved to the right. We would then meet at the vital center of the socialist left. The American Constitution, of course, would automatically be discorded. Arthur Schlesinger and his associates are also opposed to the liberation of the captive nations, even if these nations do it by themselves. These men do not look upon communism as an enemy. They consider communist leaders to be overzealous allies who will mellow. Therefore, they believe in containing communism, but otherwise supporting it, not thwarting it. They further recommend that wherever communists or socialist regimes are collapsing, we should prop them up, feed them, trade with them, grant them loans on long-term credits. From reading the daily paper, you will know that the ideas of these men have, unfortunately, already been adopted by Washington as the official policy of the United States. Now, I would say that in a great free country like ours, if these men advocate these suicidal and often treasonable doctrines, shouldn't every patriotic American be free to speak out against them? At this particular moment in history, the United States Constitution is definitely threatened, and every citizen should know about it. The warning of this hour should resound to the corridors 
of every American institution, schools, churches, the halls of Congress, press, radio, and TV. And so far as I am concerned, <laughs> and so far as I am concerned, and I'm sure so far as you are concerned, it will resound with God's help. Our Republic and its Constitution are being destroyed while the enemies of freedom are being aided. How? In at least ten ways. First, by diplomatic recognition and aid, trade and negotiations with the Communists. Two, by disarmament of our military defenses. Three, by destruction of our security laws and the promotion of atheism by decisions of the Supreme Court. Four, by loss of sovereignty and solvency through international commitments and membership in world organizations. Five, by undermining of local law enforcement agencies and congressional investigating committees. Six, by usurpations by the executive and judicial branches of our federal government. Seven, by lawlessness in the name of civil rights. Eight, by staggering national debt with inflation and a corruption of the currency. Nine, by a multiplicity of executive orders and federal programs which greatly weaken local and state governments. And ten, by the sacrificing of American manhood by engaging in wars we apparently have no intention of winning. <laughs> Wherever possible, I have tried to speak out. It is for this very reason that certain people in Washington have bitterly criticized me. They don't want people to hear the message. It embarrasses them. The things which are destroying the Constitution are the things they have been voting for. They are afraid of their political careers if these facts are pointed out. They therefore try to silence any who carry the message. Anyone... <laughs> anyone who will stand up and be counted. But these liberal politicians are not the only ones who are trying to silence the warning voice of American patriots. Moscow is equally alarmed. It was in 1960 when the communist leaders first decided to do something drastic about the rising tide of patriotism in the United States. The loss of Cuba to the Soviet Union had alerted many Americans. Citizens were holding study groups, seminars, freedom schools. The more they studied, the more they realized how fast communism was advancing on all fronts. They also learned to their amazement that most Washington politicians were doing practically nothing about it. In fact, in many cases, they were doing things to promote communism. So the protests began to pour into the national capital from every state in the Union. All over America, there was an awakening. The Soviet leaders knew this trend could create a crisis for communism, not only in the United States, but elsewhere. Therefore, they called together communist delegates from 81 countries and held a meeting in Moscow. In December 1960, just five years ago, this communist convention issued an edict that the rising tide of patriotism and anti-communism must be smashed especially in the United States. All the tricks of hate propaganda and smear tactics were to be unleashed on the heads of American patriots. Now, if the communists had been forced to do this job themselves, it would have been an utter failure. Americans would have simply closed ranks and united. But what mixes so many people up 
is the fact that the attack on patriotism and the smear of the anti-communist movement did not come in the name of Moscow. It came in the name of influential Americans who espoused the socialist communist line. This was a minority block of liberals, American liberals, who formed a propaganda coalition with the communists. Their strategy was ingenious. Almost overnight, they drew the line of fire away from the communist conspiracy and focused the heat of attack on the patriots. How did they do it? They did it by saying that they were against the communists, but also against the anti-communists. They said one was as bad as the other. Now, what kind of logic was this? What if we had taken this approach in the fight against Nazism? The informed patriots recognized it as confusion compounded by delusion. In any event, this deceptive line of propaganda had its impact. These liberal voices would denounce com communism and then turn right around and parrot the communist line. They claimed they were anti-communist, but spent most of their time fighting those who were really effective anti-communists. As I asked some of them at the time, are you fighting the communists or not? You claim to be fighting the fire, but you spend nearly all your time fighting the firemen. <laughs> By 1962, these American liberals had almost completely neutralized the insurgents, the resurgence of American patriotism. They had frightened uninformed citizens away from study groups and patriotic rallies. They had made it popular to call patri uh, patriotism a controversial subject, which should not be discussed in school assemblies or churches. From Washington, D.C., the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, issued an edict to radio and television stations that if they allowed the controversial subjects of Americanism, anti-communism, or state rights to be discussed on their stations, they would be required to give equal time free of charge to anyone wishing to present an opposite view. Can you imagine this happening in a free country? I said to my family, it is fantastic that anything like this could have happened in America. Now, we should all be opposed to socialistic communism, for it is our mortal and spiritual enemy, the greatest evil in the world today. But the reason many liberals don't want the American people to form study groups, to really understand and then fight socialistic communism, is that once the American people get the facts, they will begin to realize that much of what these liberals advocate is actually helping the enemy. The liberals hope you'll believe them when they tell you how anti-communist they are. But they become alarmed if you really inform yourself on the subject of socialistic communism. For after you inform yourself, you might begin to study the liberal voting record. And this study would show you how much the liberals are giving aid and comfort to the enemy, and how much the liberals are actually leading America towards socialism itself. For communism is just another form of socialism, as is fascism. So now you can see the picture. These liberals want you to know how much they are doing for you, with your tax money, of course, but they don't want you to realize <laughs> but they don't want you to realize that the path they are pursuing is socialistic and that socialism is the same as communism in its ultimate effect on our liberties when you point this out they want to shut you up they accuse you of maligning them of casting aspersions of being political no matter whether they label their bottle as liberalism, progressivism, or social reform, 
I know the contents of the bottle is poison to this republic, and I'm going to call it poison. We do not need to question the motive of these liberals. They could be most sincere. But sincerity, or supposed benevolence, or even cleverness, is not the question. The question is, are we going to save this country from the hands of the enemy and the deceived? As J. Edgar Hoover said, a tragedy of the past generation in the United States is that so many persons, including high-ranking statesmen, public officials, educators, ministers of the gospel, professional men, have been duped into helping communism. Communist leaders have proclaimed that communi communism must be partly built with non-communist hands. And this, to a large extent, is true. We cannot defeat communism with socialism, nor with secularism, nor with pacifism, nor with appeasement or accommodation. We can only defeat communism with true Americanism." Unquote. <laughs> so from the very beginning of this Moscow campaign to stop the anti-communist movement in this country, it was an important part of the communist strategy to get their liberal American friends to carry out an attack against patriotic organizations. Of course, the communists have learned not to attack all patriotic groups at once. Their strategy is to focus on just one organization and make it so detestable and ugly in the public mind that they can hold it up as a sort of tar baby and then use it to smear all other individuals or groups in the same category. It was inter interesting to see just where the communists would begin their dirty work. Which organization would be singled out to get the tar brush treatment? It could have been the American Farm Bureau, which the communists have consistently denounced. It could have been the American Legion, veterans of foreign wars, the DAR, the sons of the American Revolution. These have been favorite communist targets in the past, as had J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI. As it turned out, it was none of these. Instead, the communists chose to focus their attack on a fairly new organization, which very few people had heard of, about, including myself. They decided to level practically their entire arsenal on the John Birch Society. For the non-political Birch Society had within it both the policy, the program, and the personnel to help defeat the conspiracy in this country. And the communists knew it, for they had seen its results. On February 25th, 1961, the official communist paper in California, The People's World, came out with the opening blast. It said there is a new secret fascist society which is setting up cells all over the United States. They said it was the most serious threat to the American way of life. That was the signal for the block of American liberals to take up the torch, and they did. Overnight, the patriotic campaign against communism was almost completely forgotten as the liberal vigilantes heroically rode out in full force to save the country from the terrible birchers. Not only the ultra-liberal forces rallied to the battle, but some of the most respective conservative press took up the hue and cry, and many prominent, highly respected Americans also fell for the deceptive line. The communists had intended to confuse the American people, and they did. The tar brush tactics smeared the image of the new, small, but rapidly growing John Birch Society to the point where many people thought it must be a group of neo-Nazis or a revival of the Ku Klux Klan. Some prominent, highly respected men who were so deceived that they declared that the infiltration of the John Birch Society 
was equally as bad as the infiltration of the godless communist conspiracy. From the beginning of this attack, the John Birch Society pleaded for some kind of official investigation so the truth about them could be given to the public. They believed this was the only way they could counteract the tidal wave of false propaganda which was being heaped upon them. But the investigation was so long in coming that the purposes of the Communist Liberal Coalition were completely accomplished. It will probably be a long time before the official report on the John Birch Society gets an honest hearing. This investigation was conducted by trained investigators who were working for the California Senate Fact-Finding Committee on Un-American Activities. The investigation took two years. Sworn affidavits were obtained from scores of people. The attacks on the society were studied. Interviews were conducted with detractors and supporters of the society. Undetected investigators attended Birch meetings. The Senate fact-finding report was issued in June 1963. But even this report was recklessly distorted by some of the liberal press stories. I therefore obtained a copy of the report myself so I could see what was in it. The report is 62 pages long, was signed by all members of the committee, and was issued by the President Pro Tem of the California Senate Senator Hugh M. Burns, a Democrat. Here are a few quotes from the report. The society had been publicly charged with being a secret, fascist, subversive, un-American, anti-Semitic organization. We have not found any of these accusations to be supported by the evidence. And a further quote from the report, we believe that the reason the John Birch Society has attracted so many members is that it simply appeared to them to be the most effective, indeed the only organization through which they could join in a national movement to learn the truth about the communist menace and then take some positive concerted action to, pre to prevent its spread, unquote. This report also goes on to verify what I have already told you, namely that the attack against the John Birch Society commenced with an article in the People's World, California Communist Paper. Now in the light of what I have just related, you will understand my feelings when people would ask how I felt about the John Birch Society. Because of the amazing effect and the effective propaganda against them, it has been very unpopular to defend this group. I can remember when it was unpopular to defend my own church. <laughs> Never nevertheless, as soon as I learned what the communists and liberals were doing to the John Birch Society, I felt a deep indignation that this should happen to any non-political, patriotic group of American citizens. I felt it was dishonest, immoral, and crass hypocrisy. I still feel that way. One, <laughs> one liberal congressman attacked the society, claiming it was rotten to the core. Other influential liberals said they objected to the society's methods. If it was rotten to the core, the California Senate fact-finding investigators couldn't discover it. Some of the finest, best-informed Americans I know have endorsed the society and its program, including a number of former FBI agents and officials, counter-spies, intelligence and security officers, and so on. Many nationally prominent patriotic Americans serve 
without pay on its council. As to its methods, the report describes the society as a study group organization designed to, quote, first learn the facts about communism and then implement that knowledge with effective and responsible action, unquote. Now, what is wrong with such methods as these? It was communists and American liberals who objected to these methods because they were effective. They turned out to be traditional American methods that I could find no fault with. The society takes its name from one of the greatest heroes of World War II, Captain John Birch, who was murdered by the Chinese communists 10 days after the war. The society attempts through an educational and monthly action program to use every legal and moral means practicable to preserve our inspired constitution. These programs have had a real impact against the conspiracy. The various programs are purely suggestive, and the members are cautioned never to do anything that goes contrary to their conscience and judgment. The society is not a political organization. It never endorses a candidate or contributes to candidates. It encourages its members, whether they are be Democrats, Republicans, or independents, to study the issues and candidates in the light of our Constitution and the threats to it and then govern themselves accordingly. Among other th things, the society is for a balanced budget for the Monroe Doctrine, for letting the state solve their own problems. <laughs> for letting the state solve their own problems. It is against foreign aid to the communists. Uh, against the Marcus graduated income tax. And against the federal government competing with tax paying free enterprise. In a sentence, the John Birch Society believes in less centralized government, more personal responsibility, and a better world. <laughs> to stand up for the right, even when it is unpopular. Perhaps I should say especially when it is unpopular. I had to make this same decision all over again when President David O. McKay received an invitation from former Congressman John Ruslow asking that I be authorized to give a patriotic speech at a testimonial dinner for Robert Welch. President McKay, after careful consideration, told me I should take the talk and that I had his permission and blessing. And so the invitation was accepted. This talk was given at the Hollywood Palladium, September 23, 1963. Nearly 2,000 heard my talk that night, and 4,000 Kiwanians heard a similar message the following day when I spoke at their annual convention. Both talks dealt with the preservation of the Constitution and the need to resist the communist threat. At the Welch Testimonial Dinner, I commended the John Birch Society and encouraged them to protect the principles of liberty throughout the land. Of course, as all of you know, this talk brought an immediate outcry from some liberal elements in Washington. They said it was making me controversial. Patrick Henry and the Founding Fathers were also controversial. <laughs> true, true patriots have ever been. Perhaps they did not realize that I had filled this assignment with the full approval of President McKay. And perhaps they did not realize that President David O. McKay has not hesitated to speak out for freedom, even if some people have considered such patriotism as controversial. And neither will I hesitate. The fight to save the Constitution is not mere controversy, nor the fight against communism. In fact, it is a war with the devil, 
Christ versus Antichrist. And I am willing to fight it. It is a fight against the greatest evil in this world, a ruthless, powerful, godless conspiracy. J. Edgar Hoover has warned that the Cold War is a real war and that the threat is increasing. I agree, and unfortunately, we're losing the war. I think it is time for every patriotic American to join with neighbors to study the Constitution and the conspiracy. Subscribe to several good patriotic magazines, such as American Opinion. Buy a few basic books, such as Masters of Deceit, A Study of Communism by J. Edgar Hoover, The Naked Communist by Cleon Skousen, recommended by President David O. McKay in the General Conference of the Church, October 1959. Read You Can Trust the Communist by Fred Swartz and so on, and then prepare to do some independent thinking. And remember that the organized who have a plan and are dedicated, though they be few, will always defeat the many who are not organized and who lack plans and dedication. The communists know this and have proven it. Isn't it about time that most Americans realized it too? In conclusion, may I say that one of our most serious problems is the inferiority complex which people feel when they are not informed and organized. They dare not make a decision on these vital issues. They let other people think for them. They stumble around in the middle of the road trying to avoid being controversial and get hit by traffic going both ways. To the patriots, I say this. Take the long, eternal look. Stand up for, for freedom, no matter what the cost. It can help to save your soul and maybe your country. This is a choice land, choice above all others. Blessed by the Almighty, our forefathers have made and kept it so. It will continue to be a land of freedom and liberty as long as we are able to advance in the light of sound and enduring principles of right. To sacrifice such principles for momentary expediency, often selfishly motivated, is to endanger our noble heritage and is unworthy of this great American people. With all my heart, I love this great nation. I have lived and traveled abroad just enough to make me appreciate rather fully what we have here. To me, this is not just another nation. It is not just one of the family of nations. This is a nation with a great mission to perform for the benefit of liberty-loving people everywhere. It is my firm conviction that the Constitution of this land was established by men whom the God of heaven raised up unto that very purpose. This is part of my religious faith. The days ahead are sobering and challenging and will demand the faith, prayers, and loyalty of every American. As the ancient apostle declared, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. May God give us the wisdom to recognize the danger, the dangers of complacency, the threat to our freedom, and the strength to meet this danger courageously. Our challenge is to keep America strong and free, strong socially, strong economically, and above all, strong spiritually, if our way of life is to endure. There is no other way. Only in this course is there safety for our nation. In this mighty struggle, each of you has a part. Every person on the earth today chose the right side during the war in heaven. Be on the right side now. 
stand up and be counted. If you get discouraged, remember the words of Edward Everett Hale when he said, I am only one, but I am one. I can't do everything, but I can do something. What I can do, that I ought to do. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I shall do. And this is my prayer for you this day. May God bless all of you, each and every one. Thank you very much.